Pastor Darrell talked about goology. The idea that we are commanded to go and make disciples. And the idea, I love what he said, right? Two-thirds of God is go, right? Two out of three letters is go. I like that. But what made me think of when I'm sitting there is what do we expect? What do we expect? Because I feel like some of us, if we have this picture in our mind, we want to go. Some of us feel like, yes, this would be an amazing thing to go to Mexico, wash kids' feet, put shoes on their feet, talk to them about Jesus. What an amazing thing. But others of us in this room, we would expect that's going to be difficult. It's going to come with some hardship. It's going to come with some other issues. And then bringing it together here, what do we expect in our walk with Jesus Christ? See, what made me think about this is I feel like a lot of us, we walk into this room, what do you expect? For many of us, we walk into this room and you expect it's going to be the same as last week. We expect to just sit down, do our thing. For some of us, we've been doing this so long, we expect church to look exactly like it has our entire lives. Not something that is going to change us. But do you know what faith is? says that in Hebrews. Faith is being sure of what we hope for, certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Do you expect that God is going to do something? Seriously. When was the last time you walked into this space and expected something to happen? Now, again, I'm not, it's not the Pentecost thing, even though I want us to go there today. If only we would be in this room and suddenly the place is shaken and smoke and fire and tongues of fire rest on us. What an awesome church that would be, right? You'd go back and say, man, you know what happened to church today? But that was a one-time event. That was for them. That was at that time. It's not for us. But do we expect something? I want us to take us to a couple of places in Scripture. So a couple of expectation moments in Scripture. But before we jump into this, let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the table, the same place, the place where we're just a little bit closer to you. It's not as if there is something beyond what it is, the remembering, the proclamation. But there is this moment when we, in our minds, draw closer to you. I want to ask you this day, just to continue to speak to us through your word. We thank you for all that you're going to say, all that you're going to do. Help us to develop this expectation, like we expect you to do something. No, not tongues of fire and shaking the place, although that would be great. But we expect a movement from God in our lives. And how does that line up with Scripture? We just ask you to show us that. Show us what real faith is. Being sure of what we hope for, certain of what we do not see. Just want to thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Like I said, what do you expect? Now, again, I, I have a twofold thought about that. Number one, what do you expect if you are going to go? Building off of last week. But I want to give us a bigger piece to the puzzle. What do you expect from God? Now, on the one hand, we could take this into the wrong place. Because seriously, isn't that much of the objections that you hear about today? Well, how come if God is perfect and all-powerful, why didn't he make this book a little bit easier to understand? If God was perfect and all-powerful, then, then how come he doesn't just take out all the bad stuff in life? And just make this earth all over again and take out all of the bad people. How come if God is perfect and all-powerful, you fill in the blank? I don't know if you've heard those objections. See, people expect something from God, but what they expect from God falls under this category. Whether they say it or not, if I was God, I would do fill in the blank. Right? If I was God, I would just come down and show myself. Everyone would get the burning foot. Then it's not faith, right? See, here's the deal. There's, like I said, twofold thing here. Number one, 
I feel like at some point we don't expect anything. But on the other hand, we expect God to be like us and do things the way we would do things. But that's not how this works, right? So many of us go, well, if I was God, I, again, we wouldn't say it out loud, but that's the reality and that's what's behind it. But real faith is absolutely expecting that God is going to do something. And he's going to do it in a way that I don't expect. That doesn't make sense, I know. But that's the reality, right? Faith is expecting God to do something. Real faith is expecting God to do something in a way that I don't expect. That's what we want to look at today. I, again, I know this sounds weird, and I just follow me along on this. But think about it. How many of us live our day-to-day -day lives as if God was not real? Think about it. How much of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis is because we don't believe that God is real? Think about it. We go through our lives, and we don't expect God to answer the prayer. Now, I'm not talking about that prayer that you prayed when you were five, and God didn't come through and give you a pony. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when we pray, it even says that, pray and do not doubt. But how many times do we seriously, the prayer has become so routine, you don't expect anything. <clears throat> oh, you've asked a hundred prayers in your life, and God has an answer, so I really don't expect too much anymore. I've been to church a hundred times, and I don't expect anything to happen. That's not faith. Faith is expecting something from God. Let me give you some pictures in Scripture and show you what I'm talking about, and then we'll put this together with it. Well, what is God doing? Because, again, in our mind, we expect that God is just out there in the universe doing his God thing, really not paying attention to us. But Jesus gives us one phrase that I'm going to give you. And it's definitely something you should expect. I'll show you how this works. First, go into Acts. And Acts is the one place. I absolutely love the book of Acts. Y'all know that. I'm a geek about the book of Acts. I've read all kind of commentaries and all this kind of And I just keep coming back to the book of Acts. Remind yourself of this. Think table. After Jesus died, after they had the table, put on the cross, placed in a rock cut tomb. Three days later, stone is rolled away. Now, a series of things happen, but among other things, Jesus tells them in Acts chapter 1, stay in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes on you, or until the Holy Spirit is poured out on you. Now, I'm telling you, that comes with a high level of expectation, doesn't it? Jesus told them, stay here, wait, something awesome is going to happen. They didn't know what to expect. Seriously, they had no idea what to expect. They didn't even have any idea when to expect it. Oh, there were clues along the way. But the moment that it happened is Acts chapter 2, starting verse 1. That's the first part of this. I just want us to look at the setup for a minute. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together and in one place. Suddenly a sound like a violent rushing wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were staying. They saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each of them. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Pause for a minute. I guarantee you there's nobody expecting that. Right? Jesus said, I'm going to pour out the Holy Spirit, but they were not expecting that. That's the other side of the coin here. God does things in a way that we can't understand. And he's moving even today in ways that we don't expect. Again, nobody is thinking, you know, Jesus said he's going to pour out his Holy Spirit. It's going to look like this, like this, like this. No. There were subtle clues along the way. For example, in Isaiah chapter 6. You don't have to turn there. Just get the picture. You know this one. Isaiah is in the temple. Suddenly the whole temple is filled with smoke. And he sees an angel and all that, all that. That's a subtle clue as to the same day. It's really, really a similar moment in time. When Isaiah starts his commissioned work, you'd say, to the time that these guys would be commissioned. So God is always working, and he's always working in ways that we don't expect. 
but there's always clues in the past in how he worked. Think about that for a minute. Like the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, he pours out his Holy Spirit. Like I said, if only, can you imagine the after party? <laughs> what happened after this event? That was the most incredible thing ever. Yeah, Peter stands up, he preaches, people hear him speaking in all of these different tongues, right? Man, what was, what was he saying? I heard that in my native language. Can you imagine afterward what this is like? Dude, that was the best day ever. That blows away anything that ever happened to us when Jesus walked the earth. Because Jesus told him that, right? He says, it's better that I go away so the Holy Spirit can come. They were expecting something, but they weren't nearly expecting this much. Remember I said many of us, I believe, live as if God isn't real. Because we don't expect anything. But there's stuff that he said in this book that we should expect. And I'll show you one, like I said. But how does this work? It works the same way it worked with them. The second part of the story that I want us to take us to, okay, get this moment, Pentecost, an incredible moment. We are fired up for Jesus. Fast forward 10 years later. Depends on whose numbers you go by. Something like 10 to 12 years later. We go into Acts chapter 12. So from Acts 2 to chapter 12 is something like 10 to 12 years later. Peter, one of the guys who was there on the day of Pentecost, gets thrown in prison for the second time. He gets thrown in prison. They're going to put him to death the next day. We're waiting to die. And the amazing part of the story is where it says, and Peter was sleeping. Think about that, right? You know tomorrow is the day of your execution. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be sleeping. But Peter was sleeping. And an angel of the Lord comes and frees him from prison. Again, if you haven't read the story, read the story. It's an incredible story. But it's the end of the story that talks about the expectations. And why, again, 10 years down the road, the church was expecting what? The church was doing the same thing we would do. Follow me. Go into Acts chapter 12, verse 12. This is after Peter gets released. They let it, the angel leads him out of the city. He doesn't even exactly know what's going on. And then it says, as soon as he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where the many had assembled and were praying. So get the picture in your mind. We have, again, another group that's assembled in the city of Jerusalem. See the parallel here? There's a parallel. They were gathered on the day of Pentecost because Jesus said, don't leave the city. They're gathered again because Peter's in prison and they're praying. Probably what they should be doing, right? Let's think about it. Think about this for a minute. Right now, suddenly becomes illegal for us to be followers of Jesus Christ. They take away Pat, put him in prison, say he's going to be put to death. We're going to have a little prayer thing at his house. You know we are. That's what they were doing, just like we would do. We're going to pray for him. I know there's different kinds of prayers, right? Some people in that room are praying, Lord, allow Pat to remain strong. Allow Pat to fulfill what Jesus said, that when the time comes, he's able to testify. Because Jesus said, when you stand before rulers and authorities, you will be given the words you must say. So we're going to trust that, God, that's going to happen with Pat. Because we all, our prayers are about, Lord, keep Pat strong. Because we just feel like he's going to get killed tomorrow. That's how it's going to go. Maybe there's some of us that have that in the back of our minds. Lord, free him. It happened once before. He was released once before in a supernatural way. Maybe we don't even pray that one out loud. But there are some people that are expecting something to happen. And what happens? Look what it says. They're having this prayer meeting. House of John Mark's mom, Mary. Yes, another Mary in the story. They were assembled. They were praying. He knocked on the door of the outer gate, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer. She recognized Peter's voice, and because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing in the outer gate. I love that. 
They're inside praying. You know they're praying for Peter, right? Maybe they're even praying for their own safety. Don't allow any of us to get arrested too. <clears throat> Peter knocks on the outer gate. The servant girl goes out there. It's Peter. She gets freaked and runs back inside. Doesn't even open the door. you got to love that, right? She is so excited. He's been released. But remember, nobody's expecting it. She didn't expect it, and she got freaked out. Now look at the next line. How do I know they weren't expected? Look at the next line. You're out of your mind. Come on, little girl. Stop it. Don't play with our emotions. You're out of your mind, they told her. But she kept insisting. It was true. It's his angel. You get it? They weren't expecting this. They did not expect this to happen. Again, remind yourself. 10, 12 years that separated Pentecost from this moment. I bet if this was the day of Pentecost or like two or three days afterward, you'd expect it. But like every one of us, we have this tendency to fall back into the mundane, into the ordinary. We begin to fall back into our own patterns. And we stop expecting. I don't know about you. I've seen things occur. We pray and things happen. This especially happened when we become new Christians, right? Things happen that you can't explain. And all you can say is, it's God. God is at work. I prayed, and it was answered. And it was God. But the older we get, the more we have a tendency, the farther away from that moment, we have a tendency to no longer expect that, and so we explain it away. Well, that was really just my own intelligence and wisdom and skill. That wasn't God. Because we don't expect it. The last part of it, right? It says, you're out of your mind. Peter kept on knocking, and they finally opened the door, and they saw him. They were amazed, motioning to them with his hand to be silent. He described to them how the Lord brought him out of prison. Tell these things to James and the brothers. He said, and he left and went to another place, because think about it. When you get released from prison in a supernatural way, they're probably going to want to hunt you down, right? <laughs> the next morning, where's Peter? We're going to put him to death. Uh, not here, boss. Wait a minute, hold on. He was chained. He was locked. He's downstairs. You were sitting there all night. Hello? Where did he go? Search the area. So Peter's going to take off and go wherever he needs to go at this moment, right? Because that, that still is hanging over his head. But I love the picture that he paints. Peter just unpacks the whole story. Y'all, you have no idea what just happened. I was sleeping. You were going to get killed. I know. I was going to get killed. It was crazy, all right? But I'm sleeping. And I got woken up by an angel. And my chains fell off. And the door was open. And I got out of there. And they led me right out to the gate of the, of the city. But the gates are locked. I know it's crazy. They didn't expect that. Peter didn't expect it. I promise you. Peter probably at some point remembered. He, this has happened to him before. Lord, I've seen you do many, 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 many things. And I've been released from prison one time. Maybe this could happen again. But now my will, your will be done. Whatever you want, Lord. Whatever you're going to do. See, that's the balance that we need to have between expectation and a God who does the unexpected. We need to have the kind of prayer life that expects God to move, but we expect God to do it in a way that we don't expect. For example, we have some financial issues. Not, I mean, not right now. I'm just saying in general, right? You have some financial issues in your life. You pray, but do you expect something? Or do you just pray because it's just what you do? But in the back of your mind, you go, I don't expect God to really do anything. Or do you pray in such a way that you expect? Like, for example, a guy named George Mueller. He's a guy who started a series of orphanages in England. This was 100 years ago. Charles Spurgeon was part of that movement, and they wanted to get these orphan kids off the streets. And George Mueller did everything on faith because he didn't just want to take the orphans off the street of London. He wanted to show the people of London that God still works. He did not vanish. He is not gone. So 
So he said, we're going to base this whole orphanage on faith, believing. For example, there are stories he tells in his autobiography. They would, had nothing to feed the kids in the morning for breakfast. They would sit down, all the kids around the table, pray and expect God to do something. He says, sometimes you get a knock at the door. Not all the time, sometimes. Knock on the door. It's the baker. We bake too many loaves of bread. Can y'all use some here at the orphanage? Yes. That's how he operated. Expecting that God would do stuff like that. And God did stuff like that. Again, I feel like we live in a time where we just don't expect it. Now, that means that we have to believe a few things about God. Number one, do we believe that God is still at work? Seriously. Do you believe that God is still at work? In your mind, I know we want to explain it away. We want to go, well, yeah, he was involved and he's involved in this. Stop it. Seriously, do you believe that God is at work now, 2020, today, that God is at work? Do we believe that? Or do we believe that God is at work in some other big, higher level things? And he doesn't have time for me. That's part of the expectation that we need to have. Like God is seriously at work. Now, but God is going to do it in a way that you don't expect him to. Because his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Here's the flip side of the argument. You don't tell God how to work. You with me on that? This is like us guys, right? Tell me that this doesn't happen. It's like a magnet. You pull your car out into the driveway and throw the hood open. It's a guy magnet. Five guys in your neighborhood. Would you look at me? Oh, yeah, look at look. And you're going to tell me how to do the work, right? We don't tell God how to do the work. We only give it to him. Lord, here's the situation. Like he doesn't know, right? And I'm trusting that you're going to work, but I can't command you to do anything. You don't command or demand anything from God. You don't go, God, here's my bill. Pay it. Go. I'm just going to sit back and not do anything. No, no, no. We pray. This is the need. I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know what it's going to look like. But I'm trusting that you're at work. I'm trusting that you're going to do. I'm expecting by faith that the God who is at work is going to work. Now, maybe that means something will happen. There are crazy times when it means not. And we've got to be okay with that. You know what I'm saying? It's like we don't say, okay, I don't know. You have a physical injury, right? I got some back pain. God, take it away. You're demanding. Don't demand of God. But we say to God, Lord, I have this back pain. I don't know how you could work. Maybe God can give you the electronic device that's in your back, right? Maybe there's some other way. I don't know. But we're going to trust that whatever it is. Or you're going to be with me in the pain. Remember what I said about the broken body and blood that was shed? The pain. The pain is still there. But I can go through the pain because he's with me. You get it? Here's another one. What is the other expectation? Some of us in this room have other expectations. One of the deepest ones. Some of us in this room, you know who you are. Don't raise your hand. We got adult children that we're concerned about their salvation. Again, don't raise your hand. A lot of us in this room, that's part of the story. We got adult children who were uh, uh, just not, not sure where they stand with God. We've talked to them. We've given them the scripture. They own a Bible. Unless they sold it or gave it to somebody else, right? We gave them a Bible. We at least gave them the Bible app, right? Whatever it is. But we always remember that God is at work. And listen to the words of Jesus, because Jesus always has the last word, right? John 12, 32. As for me, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. Let me read that again so you don't miss it. God is at work. And part of what he's doing is what Jesus said. If I'm lifted up, and he was, he was lifted up on the cross, I will draw all men to myself. What is Jesus doing? Drawing people to himself. That's what he's doing. He's still doing it. 
But do we expect that that's what he's doing? See, there's part of the problem. For some reason, we have this idea that God's not doing that anymore. He's not drawing people to himself anymore because my adult children are being drawn to him. That's our challenge. But do you expect that God is drawing them to himself? Now, I get it. Believe me, I'm in the company. I get it. Some of them have flat out rejected, walked away. That doesn't mean God is not working. Maybe they flat out rejected. They've turned away. That doesn't mean that God is done with them. And it doesn't mean that he's not drawing them to himself. The one work that we have to be absolutely sure of is that God is drawing people to himself. Our adult children, praise God. Our co-workers, no question. The neighbors, yes. The people in the grocery store. See, if I lived my life believing that God and expecting that God is drawing people to himself, shouldn't I be on the lookout? Think about it. If I live like I believe that God right now is drawing people to himself, then that means somehow I'm on the lookout for those ones that he's drawing. You get me? This is what we've been talking about in the salt and light discussion. The idea that there are people on this journey right now. For example, I heard about this one. David Platt was speaking this past week at Southeastern Theological Seminary. I watched the, 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 the podcast or the, uh, the live stream that they had. And David Platt tells this story, and this is classic. David Platt at 3 a.m., he had to fly somewhere, and it was 3 a.m. He told his wife, I'll just get the Uber. It's cool. He couldn't rearrange his schedule. He couldn't rearrange the flights. He tried to. He couldn't. So 3 a.m., an Uber driver comes up to the house. And again, this is over the holidays. This is like in the last few months. Okay, this is a story. Gets into the car. The guy introduces himself. He's from, and he didn't say where exactly, a Middle Eastern country. Immediately you go, okay, he's Muslim. Okay, they're driving along. What do you do? David Platt says, well, I'm a pastor, and I'm a pastor of this church. Really? Pastor? Can you understand dreams? And David Platt's like, oh, wow, where's this going? <laughs> and the guy tells him, I had a dream, and it is so strange, and no one can explain to me what it is. I had a dream of a baby, a little baby in a crib, and he said to me like a full-grown person, nothing is impossible with God. Do you have any idea what that could mean? David said, it was, near, it was near Christmas, so obviously you're thinking that way anyway, right? He goes, as a matter of fact, I think I do know what that means. Because those words were used, see, because Muslims, if you don't know, the idea of God being born, in the, an infant being born, is preposterous. A Muslim would say, Jesus born in a manger, God in human form, born to a woman, preposterous, impossible. And David explained it in those terms. Nothing is impossible with God. Obviously, the drive to the airport was about 45 minutes, and David Platt's that guy who's expecting, right? Tells him about Jesus, he leads him to Christ, and he's going to David Platt's church probably this Sunday. Amen. That's how this thing works, right? Because God is, and we got to expect that God is drawing people to himself. That does not mean we don't, we're off the hook, right? It doesn't mean all i got to do is wait for the dream to come to my, my, my friend's life, and then I'll be there for him. No, 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 no. That's not what we're talking about. But we got to look for the signs. There are people in your life. Again, maybe it's our adult children, and they start asking questions. We had that experience last year with one of ours. He's asking questions. Is he there yet? No. But he's, at, he's asking questions, and I believe that God is still drawing him. He's been pushing against. But God is drawing. That leads us to the last point here. What do we expect? If God is at work, and part of the work is I will draw all men to myself, praise God, he involves us in the process then what are you expecting? Are you expecting that there's people you know that are being drawn and may even ask you a question? 
No, really, this could happen. This really seriously could happen to us if we're expecting it. But how many times are we not? Oh, like when you go to the store, when you go to get gas, we don't even talk to people. I'm guilty as anyone. We don't make eye contact. We don't talk to them. We don't engage them. But we never know where they are. And is God drawing them? Maybe you're at the gas station at that moment for that reason. And if we live in a way that we expect it to happen, oh, that's going to change everything. If we live like we believe that God is actively at work today, right now, and he's drawing people to himself right now, then we're going to live in a place of expectation. That's the greatest example we could ever have. But God will do it in a way that you don't expect. Like David Platt's story. You don't expect at 3 a.m. to have a whole lot of conversation with a Muslim guy driving your Uber. You don't expect that. You don't expect that he just had a dream that nobody could explain to him that happens to coincide with the birth of Jesus story. You don't expect that. But that's how God works. Think about your own story. I think about my story. I don't need to go over it. Y'all have heard it. I tell it all the time. I don't expect God to come into my life the way he did. I don't expect my wife to become a Christian. I don't expect any of that. So then, what else do you not expect? This should, this should for every one of us, it should change the way we pray. It should change the way we live our lives. What do you expect? What do you expect today? What do you expect as you leave here today? What do you expect God to be doing? God's not going to do it the way you expect him to either. He's not going to fit into your box. Well, if I was God, I would have my adult child see a burning bush tomorrow. He's not going to do it that way. But he can bring somebody else across his path that can say it in a way that I can't. Maybe that's our prayer. Maybe our prayer, whatever the situation is, Lord, you're drawing. Do this in a way that I never expected. Because if, you, if he does it, as he always does it, in a way that's unexpected, then who gets the glory? He gets all the glory. If he did it and it was all based on my intellect and, and experience and skill, then I would get the glory. But that's why he does it in unexpected ways. I want to challenge you as we close it today. Where do we need a little more holy expectation in our lives? Where do you right now need a little bit of this holy expectation? Like God really is drawing people. Like God really is at work. Like God really answers prayers. Let's think about that. Let's start living like we expect something to happen. And again, that's not taking that across the line. Like I'm expecting, I'm going to demand it of God. But I expect God to do things. Because he does. Let's pray. Father, as we gather today in holy expectation, what are we expecting? There's got to be moments in our lives that we just believe that you're doing something more than we can even understand. Maybe for some of us, and it is those adult children and those stories that we have in our own lives, and we're just not sure where they are. But Lord, I know you're doing more than I understand. And I just continue to pray and ask you, do this in a way that I don't expect it. I'll be here for whatever you need me to do. you got to show it. You gotta show me what I need to do. And I expect that you will. I expect that there's people in my neighborhood that are going through stuff right now. I expect that there's people right here in the neighborhood surrounding this school that need you so much. And you're drawing them. I know it because that's what you do. I know there are new people right now in this neighborhood. People moved in recently. And their lives are a mess. Maybe their first thought is not, I need to go to church. But how can we intervene in their lives and be that? 
the ministry of reconciliation like we read about in your word? How can we be the person? Lead us to those people. We expect that you will, and you'll give us the wisdom and the knowledge to be able to handle it. Lord, help us to develop this mindset that you are at work. And part of the work is drawing all men to yourself. Help us to expect it every day that I'm going to encounter somebody that's in that process, that's being drawn even today. And we want to thank you for what you're saying and doing in the process. We thank you that you are doing more than we can understand. Lord, we're going to take just a few moments of silence. Help to increase our faith in that area, in the area of expectation, like we are praying it and you're going to answer. But not in the way we demand, in the way that you do unexpected things. We take this moment of silence and we lift up those people. Maybe there's people we know right now that are being drawn. How can we be involved in that process? Maybe there are people we know that they rejected that. They pushed away from it. They were being drawn, but I don't know anymore. But you're not done. Lord, we're going to take these moments of silence. And maybe somebody comes to our mind. Maybe some situation. We just pray for what you're going to do. Take these moments of silence. Something that guides us all week. And we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name.